Good morning from New York. This is our first live telecast to Russia. We've done other countries in the past. And I'd like to say hello to all my friends in the audience and all those in the audience who will become friends in the future, which hopefully will be everybody. Uh, I was going to do this live, but because of the scheduling of the program, I'm doing this on tape, and then I will be on live later when we have our transmission. I want to talk today about exfoliation syndrome, which is a whole different disease from what people thought it was 20 years ago. These are my financial disclosures. Now, Carlton Geidesek, who got the Nobel Prize in, for his work on Kuru, uh, said once, it is important to explore, to do things others ignore, but it will become important in 10 to 20 years. I've been working now for about 35 years, even more because I started when I was a fellow on exfoliation syndrome. Uh, it's a fascinating disease, and it is a distinct disease from others that cause glaucoma or other types or forms of glaucoma, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it was discovered 100 years ago in 1917 by Lindbergh in Finland, who wrote it for his medical thesis, but didn't get credit for it for many years uh, because he showed his work to others, and they published it without mentioning his name. Uh, something for everybody to be careful about. In 1962, Achti Tarkanen, who is now 88 and going strong, uh, brought exfoliation to the world's attention with his thesis on, uh, on his medical thesis on exfoliation syndrome. And after that, it became basically known because of Lindbergh and Tarkanen as thought of as a Scandinavian disease, uh, which it is not. The problem for a long time was the American journals wouldn't take papers on exfoliation syndrome, and many other journals wouldn't, and most of the papers were published in the Acta Ophthalmologica. Now, this is all of glaucoma in one slide. And if we look for a, a hundred years, for a hundred years, basically, this top portion was glaucoma. And glaucoma was equated with elevated intraocular pressure. But it's not. We have different diseases, different distinct disorders that can cause dysfunction of the trabecular meshwork. Ex these could be exfoliation syndrome, pigment dispersion syndrome, myosillin, juvenile primary open angle glaucoma, which affect the function and cause dysfunction or blockage of the trabecular meshwork which then lead to elevated pressure, which then leads to glaucomatous damage. And the problem all along was people would wait till the pressure was elevated to start treating. Nobody paid attention to mechanisms. These diseases all have different, distinct mechanisms. Then in the 1980s or so, uh, people started looking at ischemia and uh, blood flow to the optic nerve. Uh, this was prompted by the introduction of betaxolol, uh, beta-1 uh, blocker, and uh, it was shown that uh, betaxolol improved blood flow to the optic nerve. Uh, calcium channel blockers were described as improving optic nerve head blood flow also. But there are a lot of different disorders down here uh, which cause ischemia of the optic nerve. And these are, have been called risk factors, but they are actual diseases in and of themselves, like atrial fibrillation, sleep apnea, nocturnal hypotension, uh, peripheral vascular dysregulation, which is now uh, called Flammer syndrome. And all of these can lead to ischemia of the optic nerve. Then there's another vague category which has not been explored well yet that might be primary diseases or disorders or risk factors primarily centered on the extracellular matrix of the lamina cubrosa. Uh, 
Then I will mention over here low spinal fluid pressure, low, the, which uh, Jonas has been the most uh, active proponent uh, in this area. But we can't measure this. We can't test for this. We can't measure this non-invasively. And even if we measure it invasively, we can't tell or we don't know if the spinal fluid pressure at the uh, base of the lumbar spine is the same as that in the uh, brain. So we will, leave, we will leave that alone for now. Then we have a whole series of findings which are common to uh, neurodegenerative disorders across the board. And these primarily include oxidative damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, low-grade inflammation, microglial activation, and the others which you can see here. And in all of these disorders, all the neurodegenerative disorders, these, these if you want to call them risk factors, so be it, come into play, and they occur before the nerves degenerate. And we'll come back to this because I think it is a very important facet of the way we are beginning to conceive of glaucoma now and we will do so more and more in the future. All right, now I want to mention one disorder or combination of disorders which reflects on what I'm going to say along the way. Uh, we described combined pigment dispersion and exfoliation a number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And it occurred in people who had pigment dispersion in the past, which was now either burned out or well controlled, and suddenly went out of control in one eye. And we pinned it down to the development of exfoliation syndrome, which is another pigment-related disease, in one eye and called it overlap syndrome. Overlap in the sense that first they start out with pigment dispersion, it's under control, it's gone away, and now another disease starts up. Pigment dispersion, as you know, is a disease of younger people and exfoliation of older people. And in any of these disorders, a number of different risk factors can come into play. It's not necessarily that you have one entity. You can have one en specific entity and a number of different risk factors, and the more risk factors you have for glaucomatous progression, then the faster it progresses and the more severe it can become. So let's look at exfoliation and compare it to pigmentary. Exfoliation classically gives you a three-ring sign. You see the central disc, clear intermediate zone, and peripheral granular zone. Where is in pigment dispersion, you have this mid-peripheral iris transillumination defects uh, in a radial pattern. In exfoliation, you get transillumination, but it is at the pupillary border. This slide, it doesn't show in this slide, and it's not meant to. This is not a whole rundown of all the findings in exfoliation syndrome. Uh, here is the typical angle in exfoliation syndrome. We see uh, kind of smudgy pigment on Schwabi's line, I mean on the trabecular. We kind of see smudgy pigment on the trabecular meshwork. It's not... It's not even, uh, and it may correspond in some fashion to the outflow channels. There's pigment on Schwabi's line, and then on the peripheral corneal shelf, this wavy sample easy line, which is pretty much characteristic of exfoliation syndrome. Compare that to pigment dispersion, where you get this dense, even black band of pigment on the, me on the trabecular meshwork. The iris is posteriorly inserted, and comes forward. People with myopia, the higher the myopia, tend to get pigmentary glaucoma faster and more severely. Patients who are hyperopic with greater amount of lens uh, iris touch tend to be the ones to get glaucoma over myopes. So coming back to here, I'm just going to mention on this slide once again to keep in mind that normal tension glaucoma, what we've called normal tension glaucoma all along, 
falls into this area. But you can have exfoliation syndrome, which is typically a high-pressure glaucoma, a very high-pressure glaucoma. But if you have exfoliation syndrome and also have sleep apnea or nocturnal hypotension or atrial fibrillation, then you can get uh, more and more rapid uh, progression of the glaucoma. What we could not find right after we described the overlap syndrome was the next thing we thought we'd look for would be exfoliation syndrome with normal tension glaucoma, which would progress rapidly. We had a great deal of difficulty finding these patients, and we still have. We do not see many patients with what we would call normal tension glaucoma and also exfoliation syndrome. And I will defer the discussion of why, uh, because that takes a while. Now, overall, exfoliation syndrome is the most common identifiable cause of open-angle glaucoma in the world. It accounts for the majority of cases in some countries, uh, it, like Norway, Iceland. Uh, it's extremely common in Russia. When I was in Kazakhstan, seven out of ten patients they showed me had exfoliation. It's rare in other countries like southern China. Okay? But it is not a form of glaucoma. It's not a type of glaucoma. It's an ocular manifestation of a systemic disease, and we will come to that. But the main thing, it has specific mechanisms of causation, development, and distinct biochemical and, and cellular abnormalities. And this was overlooked for 90 years. Okay, I was... Uh, came out of the Harvard Biology Department in the early days of cell biology when uh, everything was being discovered on electron microscopy, ribosomes, synapses, mitochondrial Christi, and everything we thought of was in terms of mechanisms, and that's what carried me through basically my entire career. And I said, this is a disease with specific mechanisms, and if we can interfere at any step through the mechanism before the elevated intraocular pressure occurs and before they get glaucomatous damage, then we can stop a significant proportion of glaucoma. And it is very significant because the Lindbergh Society, which we started about 20 years ago to study this, uh, which only had 30 members then, uh, we estimated there, there were 60 to 80 million people in the world with exfoliation syndrome, but it was largely ignored and underdiagnosed until recent years. And hardly anybody was doing any research on this. Now, what can we do? We know that, you know, ordinary glaucoma, you treat them with medicine, treat them with laser, treat them with surgery. And it's, it's a stepwise process like a cookbook for all the glaucomas. All the glaucomas are pretty much treated in the same way because for a long time, all the glaucomas were looked at as just two kinds, open angle and angle closure. Remember that even open angle and angle closure glaucomas were not formally differentiated from each other until 1953 at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, even though there was evidence for that for 50 years before that. Now we know that glaucoma is many different diseases, including primary open-angle glaucoma. And the only reason it's called primary open-angle glaucoma is because when you look at it at the slit lamp, you don't see anything else. So there's no name to give it. Uh, we, when we, Bruce Shields and Ted Cooper and I wrote our uh, second textbook, we wanted to change it to idiopathic open-angle glaucoma. Uh, thereby allowing for every time a mechanism or a new type was discovered and identified, it would the pool of uh, idiopathic open angle glaucoma would become uh, smaller and smaller. But we didn't, and it's still primary open angle glaucoma. What else can we do besides the routine cookbook methods? Here is the classic pattern with the central disc, the intermediate zone, and the peripheral granular zone. The intermediate zone is created by the iris rubbing over the lens when the exfoliation becomes thick enough to rub off. And during its normal excursions, 
And remember this mechanism. It's basically during the normal excursion of the iris across the lens during constriction and dilation that allows the iris, when it lands at the peripheral edge of where it's going to touch the lens, starts scraping off exfoliation material, and it stops when the iris doesn't go any further in normal, uh, normal pupillary movement. And here is an earlier stage. The exfoliation is laid down by the iris pigment epithelium, the ciliary epithelium, the peripheral preequatorial lens epithelium, and other tissues in the anterior segment to some degree, like corneal endothelium and trabecular cells, but that's a minor component. The first three are the major components. And when the exfoliation material gets thick enough, the iris starts to scrape off these clefts, okay? It's kind of, the analogy is like a snow plow uh, in winter. It doesn't plow with the blade right along the top of the street uh, because it'll break on a manhole cover. So it rides a half an inch high. And the same thing here when the exfoliation material builds up to a certain level, it starts scraping off uh, what we call these early clefts. And at the same time, the exfoliation material on the lens acts like sandpaper, and it scrapes the pigment off the iris. It disrupts the iris, and the first thing to go is the iris rough, the pigment rough. When I started working on this, when we did our first paper, uh, it was the, published in the Archives of Ophthalmology in 1986. Uh, Prince was the first author on pigmentary signs to detect exfoliation before you could see it on the lens. One of these was pigment release and loss of the pupillary, the loss of the pupillary rough. And we found only two papers since 1950 on the pupillary rough in the literature at that time. Here you see a blob of pigment coming off the ruptured cells of the pupillary rough. And we caught this fortuitously. It's it's, it's a drop of pigment, a blob of pigment. But 10 minutes later, this pigment would be diffusely spread across the anterior chamber. Now, I'm going to just mention here, just, I'm not going to go slide by slide. I'm just going to mention things when they occur to me that I think are important that are not necessarily on slides. When you see this, you have to be careful about that pigment causing a rise in pressure later on. Now, one of the major reasons that exfoliation was underdiagnosed, especially in this country, in the United States, there were three people working on it. Nobody cared. The, when the pupil is dilated, you're not going to see the exfoliation unless you look for it. Okay, So it's important to look at the, at the lens after pupillary dilation. And to do that, you have to know what it looks like. And you have to suspect it, and you have to realize its importance. Otherwise, it's all for naught. And when you see moderate amount of pigment in the anterior chamber, look very carefully exfoli for exfoliation syndrome. If you don't see it, but you still see a moderate amount of pigment, there are other things that can cause it. But if the patient is older, follow that patient for the development of exfoliation. At the same time, keep the patient around for a while and measure the intraocular pressure after dilation, which is something you should always do anyway. When the pigment is dispersed throughout the anterior chamber, you may not get an immediate pressure rise. We took the pressures for three hours after dilation and found a maximum at about two hours. The pressures could go from 16 to 32 after a couple of hours because the pigment that was in the anterior chamber is now settled out on the trabecular meshwork, causing blockage. And the angle I showed you before, there's just more pigment in the involved eye in unilateral cases, and eyes with glaucoma tend to have more pigment than the fellow non-glaucomatous non eyes.
Now, what about directed therapy? Okay, this is a very simple term. All it means is specific treatments for specific diseases. It hasn't been applied in glaucoma. In glaucoma, you just knock down the, you wait till the pressure's up, don't do anything about preventing the pressure from going up, and then try to hammer it down. Uh, whether it's medicine, laser, surgery. The ideal treatment is to prevent its formulation, its formation or remove the material before the glaucoma develops. If you have a, if a pressure is 40, the way what's been applied until now, if the pressure is 40, you make it 20. If it's 30, you make it 15. If it's 20, you make it 10. If you're a Neanderthal and the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And so we need to find the mechanism, discover the mechanisms leading to glaucoma and treat the risk factors leading to the disease. Uh, now I'm going to stop here for a second, and Sean, and take because you're going to edit this anyway. Uh, I, that's going to go on too long. Okay, so so we're going to have to we'll shorten some of that stuff out because uh, I I do this in lectures too. I start talking. Okay, in the past five years, uh, exfoliation has hit worldwide prominence. Partially because the uh, we devoted all of our Glaucoma Foundation think tanks to exfoliation. We decided to put all our efforts into exfoliation. We've given a million dollars in pilot grants. And uh, I got a million dollars from a patient to work on the cell biology, which we'll come to. The only specific therapy we have at the present time, though, that's practical is myotics. Now, nobody uses pilocarpine anymore. People think of 4% pilocarpine four times a day, and it causes meiosis and decreased vision and posterior synecheus. That is not necessarily true. Myotics are the one drugs that we have that increase aqueous outflow, and nobody uses it. We have drugs that increase uveal scleroflow and decrease episcleral pressure and decrease inflow, we have no good drug except pilocarpine for outflow. And what we found was that 2% pilocarpine at bedtime limits pupillary movement. It gives you a 3 millimeter non-reactive pupil for 24 hours. And that stops the iris from rubbing against the exfoliation. Of a front. That stops the iris from rubbing against the lens and it decreases or eliminates the, the uh, scraping away of the exfoliation material from the lens. It decreases the pigment release from the iris, and it slows down the disease markedly. And we combine that with prostaglandin analogs. Those are our, my first choice is a prostaglandin analog, and then add a myotic if the pressure is still uh, very, it's either fluctuating or is still too high. And Bernie Becker in 1985 in the Journal of Glaucoma wrote a great editorial, which all the residents ought to look at, uh, suggesting that aqueous suppressants like beta blockers may worsen the disease by slowing aqueous flow through the trabecular meshwork. Okay, so what else can we do? Okay, the one thing we have is pilocarpine, and it really works well. Uh, two percent at bedtime, not QID. Maybe we can depolymerize. The next step is how can we get rid of this material? Can we depolymerize it? Well, Carlo Montemagno, who's a leading nanotechnologist in uh, in Canada, uh, came up with the idea of using engineered nanoparticles, which get through the cornea with a uh, engineered shell that can penetrate the cornea, break up inside the anterior chamber, and attach to the exfoliation material, and then use magne magnetic uh, energy to break up the aggregate, either physically or thermally. And that's just one nanotech idea uh, as a no, whole nother future nanotechnology is being used in medicine and it's beginning right now.
Um, here is the earliest stage of exfoliation. This is uh, this is pre-granular exfoliation, and you can notice these finger-like fronds of exfoliation material on the lens. It's hard to pick this up. It's hard to detect, but this was my eye seven years ago, and I had two plus pigment in the AC and a pressure of 26 after dilation, and just con just concurrently, just by accident, I started curcumin. I've been doing uh, now lecturing for, for about uh, 20 years on various supplements, antioxidants, mitochondrial protectants, uh, low-grade inflammatory inhibitors. Uh, and just by accident, at that time, I started taking curcumin, and the, it's gone. Now, this does not affect uh, mature fibers. It only seems to do something with pregranular. I was, I don't have any of those other signs anymore. I have five patients with the same thing, but this is purely anecdotal, uh, and I can't really say anything more in terms of proof. Well, curcumin itself, when I started talking about it, there were a thousand papers in the literature. There are now 10,000 papers, and it inhibits every inflammatory factor known to man. It inhibits the, all the interleukins. It inhibits a lot of uh, enzymes and kinases, which function in glaucoma detrimentally, okay? Among those that have been reported to make glaucoma worse are MAP-K, uh, the junk pathway, uh, VCAM1, ICAM1, come over to gene, those factors that exhibit or inhibit uh, gene expression like COX-2, uh, and here we have LOX, which we'll come to, and, and various receptors and growth factors, uh, including TGF-beta. All of these can influence uh, inflammation and other, uh, other pathways throughout the body, and it seems to uh, also improve. Now, it's been used for 3,500 years in Ayurvedic medicine, but over that time, it's been reported to be therapeutic against many chronic diseases, which include Alzheimer's, arthritis, colitis. And I have found it to be useful, actually, and, and improve, uh, again, anecdotally, but to improve symptomatology and function in people with colitis, arth rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, Alzheimer's. And it may be useful in, in all these other diseases, but I don't have the... Uh, the um, experience with them. However, uh, I can tell you that it does really objective proof, obj I have objective evidence of its function in arthritis and colitis. And I do it on hope in uh, patients with exfoliation syndrome. Okay, let's go to uh, asymmetric exfoliation. Now, two-thirds of patients with exfoliation present with it only in one eye. One-third have it in both eyes. Some patients progress fast. Some patients progress slowly. Are these different manifestations? We think they're the same disease. We have no evidence that says they're different diseases. However, the genetic composition may underlie the asymmetry or the presentation. And the cumulative probability of clinically uninvolved fellow eye, and here you see the fellow eye with an intact pupillary rough, and here you see the eye with exfoliation, the pupillary rough is completely gone. It's the, the probability in 15 years of developing it in this eye is about 50%, which is the same probability they have of dying. Uh, however, we just took it for granted that Okay, it appeared in one eye and then the other eye later, just like uveitis. And about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I called up, I really wondered about this. Why? What's stopping it in the other eye? Because we knew that we could detect or suspect at least exfoliation syndrome when we saw these other pigment signs like pigment in the anterior chamber on dilation, pigment on the loss of the pupillary rough, pigment on the collarette area, uh, collarette uh, iris uh, 
sphincter area, transillumination. These were preliminary signs of exfoliation. So we knew, the idea struck me that if we could detect what's protecting the second eye, we could translate that back to the first eye and prevent the development of exfoliation syndrome in the first place. We had no idea what. Maybe it was immune suppression, maybe something else. We did not have the science, we did not think about it, and there were only a few of us to think about it in the first place. I called up Bob Nussenblatt at the NEI and asked him why uveitis was often unilateral, and he said he didn't know. He was head of the NEI uveitis division. I said, if he doesn't know about uveitis, I can't, how can I worry about exfoliation too much? But now we realize that this is a very important question because if we can find a way to protect, if we can find out what is protecting the second eye from developing it, we can translate that to the first eye and stop the progression or formation of the disease. Now, there are many as ocular associations of exfoliation syndrome, and the list is getting longer. I'm not going to go into any of these in detail because of time, uh, but in addition to open angle glaucoma, it's a major cause of angle closure, which was thought to be rare uh, until uh, we show, I did my AOS thesis on it and showed that 28% of people with appositional closure or angle closure on conjunctival biopsy, which I did with Ursula Schletcher Schrehart in Germany, had angle, had exfoliation. So exfoliation is very common underlying cause of angle closure except perhaps in China where it's most common, but exfoliation is rare. And it's also closely associated with cataract, zonular weakness, retinal vein occlusion, and now ocular surface disease, which is also uh, a very important recent hot topic. Unilateral cataract and exfoliation are almost invariably in the same eye. I think in 4,000 patients, I've seen cataract in one eye and exfoliation in the other eye maybe once, okay? And why is that? Well, it's, an oxid it's a disease of oxidative damage. There's markedly reduced ascorbate in eyes with cataract and exfoliation compared to eyes without, with cataract without exfoliation. And there are many other papers, some of which we've published, a lot out of Greece, uh, showing decreased antioxidant anti activity in the anterior chamber. And the amount of ischemia and oxidative damage correlate with the severity of intraocular pressure and glaucoma. And here you see the typical pattern of zonules. The zonules are heavily affected in exfoliation syndrome. We used to think that the zonular material was just overlaid like ice on a high tension wire with exfoliation material. It's not the zonular elastic fibers disappear. This is an ongoing process. Zonules are metabolically active and they are replaced by exfoliation material, which fragments and then leads to dis lens dislocation, subluxation, and all of the additional possible complications that occur because of this such as a uh, nuclear fallout uh, capsular rupture at the time of phaco emulsification. This was much more common during extracapsular cataract surgery, and now that phaco techniques are using much less power and we have better instrumentation and more awareness, it was really the cataract people that became aware before the glaucoma people of the importance of of making the diagnosis of exfoliation, uh, the complication rate has come way down. Now, I mentioned this is an ischemic disease, and it's not just in the anterior chamber, but here you see an iris angiogram by Lotta Kynan in Finland from the 1970s, and you can see uh, microneovascularization, microthrombi, and what happens in is that the iris vessels become, all the capillaries become full of exfoliation material. And 
when they're non-functional, when they're really packed with exfoliation material, they're non-functional, the parasites peel away, and you're, led, you're left with just uh, strands or bundles of exfoliation material in the iris. And that leads to all these other problems. We don't know much more than that. We know very, we know very little histology. You can't do it on live eyes. Uh, it's hard to do histology on a small iridectomy specimen. And so we still need a lot. We still need to learn a lot about what the iris is doing in exfoliation syndrome. We think it is a major player outside of just producing the exfoliation material and how and why does it do that. Okay, now there are a whole number of, uh, there are a whole number of other uh, manifestations. This is an ischemic disease and it's an ischemic disease not only in the eye, but systemically. Here in the eye are just a list. This is a laundry list. You can read it. I'm not going to go through this uh, for time. You can read faster than I can speak. But basically, there's impaired endothelial function. Okay? And now that we're getting to the area, into the age or era of being able to do stem cell washes and perhaps improve endothelial function, and I am not standing on either yes or no uh, as far as that goes, but it is something that people are trying and people are talking about. Maybe we can start improving the vascular, uh, the vascular pathways in patients with exfoliation. There's reduced ocular perfusion pressure, and we found an association with central retinal vein occlusion. It's a systemic disease, and that's why I say you can't call this a type or form of glaucoma. This is an ocular manifestation of systemic disease. The first one described was in 1992 in Finland by Repo, who described transient and increased uh, incidence of transient ischemic attacks in patients with exfoliation. There is a whole list of cerebrovascular and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, the Blue Mountains Eye Study uh, claimed an association with stroke and myocardial infarction. It was at the 0.06 level, and it was one a little two-page paper in the back of the AJO. So until this is really looked at, I can't say anything past that. It was not uh, highly statistical, but what they did find statistically significant was angina. Aortic aneurysms have been on again, off again. The latest is, yes, there is a connection. Uh, re recently, renal artery stenosis. There are about eight papers on Alzheimer's, four yes, four no, so we don't know really what the connection is there. There are about 10 papers now on hearing loss and exfoliation. All 10 have been positive. There is a definite association between hearing loss and exfoliation. But nobody's looked at these, okay? The, the choroid plexus in the brain, the arachnoid villi, are structurally analogous to the, uh, to the ciliary body and the tubercular meshwork. We know the ciliary body is covered with exfoliation material. We know it all goes to the tubercular meshwork. They've had the problem with, in Germany. I've talked to everybody uh, in Germany and in Norway, and they say just the legal problems of getting their hands on the material has prevented looking at this. But I think it's really, really important. It's one of the one, number one things to do on my list is to look at the choroid plexus and arachnoid villi in patients with exfoliation syndrome. As far as hearing loss, well, you can say the organ of Corti, the uh, inner hair cells, and say, well, there's an analogy there too, uh, but that's very hard to get to and very hard to do electron micro microscopy on. So that, even though the hearing loss is definite, Nobody's really done the pathology electron microscopy on patients with exfoliation and hearing loss. And there are a number of blood flow abnormalities. All, now, all papers looking for it 
and there's probably at least 10 now, uh, have found elevated homocysteine levels in patients with exfoliation syndrome. And all of these associations here, the cardiac and the arterial disease, and are all associated with elevated homocysteine. So is homocysteine a causative factor, or is it just an associated factor in the disease? What is its role? We've had three sections now, sessions in, the fi in five or six years, at the think tank on hyperhomocysteinemia. We still don't know. Uh, low folate. Can you treat people with folic acid and lower the homocysteine and we slow down and reverse the exfoliation syndrome? We're not sure. It may be too late. It may be that you have to do this really early in the disease. But it certainly needs a lot more study, and we need a good animal model, which we don't have, in which we can test the effects of things like folate and homocysteine. Why is there no increased mortality? There have been four papers now on increased mortality. I mean, four papers on mortality in exfoliation syndrome. And you'd expect, if these patients have higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, uh, other, di other disorders that can lead to earlier death, why is there no increased mortality in papers uh, looking at it? Well, I will give you, uh, I'll give you uh, two reasons in a couple of minutes. We have found, we started looking at other diseases. We said, look, what about other elastic diseases? What about other LOX-L1 diseases? And I have a slide. I'm going to come to that in a minute because I don't want to throw this too much out of order. Okay, systemic findings first described in 1992 by Ursula schletzer schreyhart in Germany and Barbara Streeten in, in New York. And they each had one autopsy case with exfoliation, and they found exfoliation-like fibrils in many different organs, including heart, lung, uh, kidney, and meninges. And one patient had died of a ruptured esophagus and the other of a ruptured aorta. And we said, well, maybe this is a conformational dis Maybe it's like a Marfan's disease of old people, except it's far, far more common than Marfan's. And, but we suggested that maybe fibrillin, which is, was in Marfan's, found in Marfan's, had something to do with exfoliation syndrome. And, and it turned out uh, it was. Um, but we predicted it long before we found it. Now, here's a cardiac muscle. Here, here is a heart muscle on electron microscopy, and you can see all its exfoliation material. Does this have, is this just sitting there? Is it there by accident and it's not doing anything? Or does it relate to cardiac disease? Does it relate to myocardial ischemia? <clears throat> we don't know, and nobody's looked at it. There's zero in the cardiology literature because the, if the ophthalmologists mostly didn't recognize it for close to 100 years, the cardiologists don't know anything about it. We are now trying to... Uh, teach the cardiologists here to see if there's a connection between various cardiovascular disorders uh, that they see in exfoliation syndrome, but that's really at the beginning. So we don't know what this material is doing elsewhere. So now we said, well, maybe there's other LOXL1 disorders that have not been associated with exfoliation syndrome, but that are abnormal, that they're abnormally uh, present or that there's an increased prevalence of these diseases in patients either with exfoliation, LOXL1 abnormalities. And Barbara Warosko, I suggested this to Barbara Warosko a few years ago, and she's at Salt Lake City where they have a Utah database uh, for the Mormons. And Mormons are meticulous about uh, their, their databases for medical histories, and it goes back about eight generations. 
And in 2008, Alper and et al. had reported that LOXL1 knockout mice had pelvic organ prolapse. And he said, you know, maybe there's an increase in LOXL1 abnormalities, LOXL1 mutations in patients with pelvic organ prolapse. And uh, Joe et al. had described the decreased expression of LOXL1 in fibrillin 5 and suggested a defect in, of elastic fiber remodeling. Well, that set us off on looking at elastic fiber diseases. And last year in JAM Ophthalmology, we found that the risk for exfoliation syndrome in women with pelvic organ prolapse was three times as high. And that exfoliation may be associated with pelvic organ prolapse through damage and impaired LOXL1 repair to elastin containing connective tissues. We couldn't work the other direction because exfoliation was not diagnosed. Uh, and so it was really way, way underdiagnosed in the Utah database. So we worked with the patients with POP uh, and found the increased incidence of exfoliation syndrome. There are other LOXL1 dissociated disorders, and I'm not even getting into non lox to other LOXLs. Remember, there are five LOX, there are five LOX uh, genes. Well, inguinal hernia was one, varicose veins, endometriosis, subacute coronary, subacute cervical artery deficiency, uh, I think, is the most common stroke, is the most common cause of stroke in people under the age of 55. And for years I've been saying, I, we don't have a neurology ward here. We don't have neurology patients. But those in, who are in hospitals with neurology wards, to look at patients with cervical artery dissection to see if there's an increase in exfoliation syndrome. The reason being that one of the uh, LOXL1 is a major candidate gene for SCAD, and one of the uh, SNPs associated with exfoliation syndrome showed a marginal association with SCAD. So this is a place to look, but nobody's looked at it yet. Um, and there may be other disorders also. Well, this year at Arvo, we took, again, in, from, Utah, from the Utah database, we looked at inguinal hernia, found out there was a significant increase in inguinal hernias associated with exfoliation in men. And what's really interesting is COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Well, if you have exfoliation syndrome, you have a 25% greater chance of developing COPD. If you have exfoliation syndrome and COPD, you live longer than people without exfoliation who have COPD. And so there's something about exfoliation, even though you have all these uh, disorders associated with mortality, that allows you to live longer. And we don't know what it is we're looking for that. Uh, now, just to touch on the genetics, because this is a whole nother person's talk, and uh, just two snips. The first uh, paper by Thorleifson and Al, and et al. in Science back in 2007 showed these two SNPs in the exon 1 of the LOXL1 gene accounted for 99% of affected Caucasians. There was a different SNP in Japan, in South Africans, the, uh, I think it was the Zulu, and the Zulu, and then later the Bantu. Uh, you flip, the, the frequency of the alleles was flipped. But essentially, these are the two alleles in, involved throughout the world in exfoliation syndrome. The problem is that they're not causative because 80% of the population without exfoliation has the same SNPs. And you go to southern China where it's rare, uh, maybe 1% of the population has exfoliation syndrome, they still have a very high rate of these two affected SNPs. So there's got to be something else going on. 
The LOX L1, is, as I mentioned, is expressed by vascular smooth muscle cells. Its function is to catalyze cross-linking of elastin and collagen. It's essential for the formation and maintenance of elastic fibers and extracellular matrix homeostasis. As we see in these elastic tissue disease, there's something going on, something's wrong. And there are other genes. So we said, okay, LOXL1 is not causative. Well, uh, the year before last, Tinong and CC Core and then later Maneo Ozaki, who brought in uh, all the exfoliation uh, specimens from Japan, they now have 12,000 patients with exfoliation and about 110,000 normals from about 50 countries. Uh, and they showed the second gene, uh, CAC and A1A, uh, or CAC and 1A, is associated with the susceptibility to exfoliation syndrome. Fibrillin needs calcium to form stable aggregates of exfoliation material. So now here you have two genes affecting the trabecular meshwork. They also recently described this year in, in Nature Genetics uh, five additional genes mostly related to the extracellular matrix. So now we have seven genes, and the question is, how do they fit together? And does everybody need seven genes to get exfoliation? Or you can have five of them, one, and others can have five, but as long as you have the LOX L1, maybe there's different manifestations, different systemic disorders. Can you have systemic diseases without having it in the eye? Uh, does it account for unilateral versus bilateral expression? Does it account for the rate of development or of exfoliation syndrome in the eye and the pileup of material? Does it account in any way for the predisposition to glaucoma? All of this remains to be discovered. The one thing that was found was a rare variant, and there's only been two described before, one in exfoliation, uh, I mean one in uh, Alzheimer's in 2012, one in coronary artery disease in 2014, that a PY407F was a protective variant. It was found in two of the 12,000 exfoliation cases, 68 of the controls. And that's a very, very high rate, even though it's small numbers here. And the 407 variant appears to prevent the development of exfoliation syndrome. So it's just, we're adding in more and more to the uh, picture, and then we have to figure out how that picture leads to exfoliation syndrome. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on all this. It's a long slide. All I want to do is point out this area here. Uh, it's, the extra, it's the extracellular matrix. We look on exfoliation syndrome as a disease of overproduction of the extracellular matrix or instability or both. And you have elastin up here. You have uh, fibulin 5 down here. And the LOXL1 binds the fibulin 5 of the extracellular matrix to the, to the elastin uh, polymers. And then there are other, like cal calcium is needed. Uh, and we don't know what the other molecules do, but they are somehow also related to the extracellular matrix. There's a gene environment interaction, apparently. Lou Pasquale at Harvard has been concentrating on this, and he has described uh, increased uh, exfoliation associated with uh, the amount of caffeine intake. Uh, caffeine intake is very high in Scandinavia, so is exfoliation. Solar exposure. People in the desert, people in the, where there's a lot of ice, uh, seem to get exfoliation more. And he did a paper which you can just look at showing that in the very northern tier of the United States and the very southern tier uh, have different rates of exfoliation syndrome, different frequencies, irrespective of age, race, and other parameters. So in the future, we've got to figure out what these genes do, what are the pathways, and what's the effect on the phenotype, 
And then could these genes become new treatment targets, especially LOXL1? If we can take LOXL1 apart and look at it, and now people are working on micro RNAs, small RNAs, and the effect of uh, other promoters and uh, coenzymes, how can we affect the LOXL1 enzyme to <laughs> make a normal protein and prevent the development of, of exfoliation syndrome? There have been several growth factor abnormalities. I'm going to skip those. The main thing to remember is that there's elevated TGF beta 1 in exfoliation, which is normal in POAG. And there's elevated TGF beta 2 in POAG, whereas TGF beta 1 is normal. Beta 1 induces the synthesis of extracellular matrix, and we hypothesize a strong role in the pathogenesis of exfoliation syndrome. Now, there's one other thing that I kind of like. Uh, one theory means to be proven. There are several papers in the literature that are non, that are, you know, just kind of uh, almost anecdotal. They're small papers. But there are four papers in the literature with 12 patients uh, with reports of younger donors in their 20s and early 30s who received corneal buttons for transplantation from older patients who developed exfoliation shortly after the corneal transplant. And I started thinking, and I still think, and I'd like to see it ruled, out, ruled in or out one way or the other, as to whether exfoliation syndrome could be a slow prion disorder. These have only been described recently, but just like conformational disorders 15 years ago, they, uh, the list is growing and growing. It, okay, it's pages long. And the same thing with prions. It was described in Kuru and the spongiform encephalopathies, and then in lesser and lesser, slower forms, and now slow prion disorders that can take 40 years to develop. Just like Alzheimer's may develop and start developing in your 20s, exfoliation may start doing the same thing. We don't know. This remains to be looked into. Uh, okay, let me come to the cell biology. We're getting to the end here. I was looking at, I was interested in looking at the three-dimensional structure in tissue culture, hoping that three-dimensionally we could get enough exfoliation material growing off of fibroblasts to harvest the material to look at it through nanotechnology and, and mass spectroscopy and try to figure out more of the chemical structure. Well, we went a lot farther than that. Uh, the main characters here were uh, Andy Watt, who was a postdoctoral fellow from England with us, uh, and Mario Willowson and Audrey Bernstein at Mount Sinai. Now, lysosomes uh, are intracellular vesicles that degrade waste, okay? They're garbage pails. And the accumulation of undegraded protein aggregates underlies all the neurodegenerative diseases. It's found in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, ALS. And the lysosomal abnormalities could cause accumulation of abnormal exfoliation material. And the drugs, I'm jumping ahead now here, if that's all true, then drugs that improve lysosomal function may help to reverse exfoliation syndrome. Inside the cell, the lysosomes, okay, they're little, these are, they're little garbage pails. They pick up all the waste. They pick up degenerated mitochondria, uh, misfolded proteins, which exfoliation is, and overproduced proteins and other degenerated junk within the cell. And they travel along the microtubules to the nucleus, where they become uh, phagosomes, and then they're incorporated in the, in the nucleus. They're degraded and recycled, okay? Look, the nucleus holds the chromosomes, but it's also a recycling plant. And what we found was that the Lysosomes didn't bind well in the microtubules, but they didn't get carried to the nucleus either, and I'll show you that in a second. 
what we found was that the microtubule organizing center is mislocalized. Here's the POAG cell, which is the same as a normal cell. And the microtubule organizing center is inside the nuclear membrane. In exfoliation syndrome, it's outside the nuclear membrane. And I have been trying to get them to do electron microscopy for the last couple of years on this. They haven't gotten around to it. I really would like if somebody in this audience has, you ha I mean, I, you have tons of exfoliation syndrome in Russia, okay? Do electron microscopy on the microtubule organizing center in POAG normals and exfoliations and see what it looks like because I want to see this. I want to live to see all this figured out. Now, if we look at the lysosomes in the fibroblasts that we were growing, they don't localize to the perinuclear area under serum-free conditions, okay, which is how we grow them uh, to get the, the, uh, some, of these, some of the reactions going. I should just summarize it like that. Here is POAG on this side, and here is exfoliate. No, he, I'm sorry. These are exfoliation cells. POAG is down at the bottom. If we look at the cells, the tenons fibroblasts in culture with exfoliation, the lysosomes are pink, and they're all around the periphery. The cells are twice the size of normal, and there's tons of lysosomes, and they're not going anywhere. They're just piling up. And our hypothesis is they dump this material into the extracellular space, uh, whether it's through membranes, produced by membranes, or what. We don't know yet, okay? This is just beginning. But that they contain the exfoliation material and they don't go to the nucleus. In POAG, on the other hand, you can see that there are much fewer lysosomes, the cells are smaller, and they localize to the perinuclear area. So there's something basically wrong with the, mic with the lysosomes in exfoliation, the size of the cells, the ma malformation or, or misbinding to the microtubules, the lack of migration to the nucleus where the, peri uh, where the mitochondrial organizing center is abnormal. They are not made into phagosomes, and we wind up with classic exfoliation as a result. When, when this is carried down the line. We looked at one drug, davunatide, which is a peptide in trials now for Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases which stabilize microtubules and improve lysosomal function. Here's exfoliation cells without davunatide, and when you give them the davunatide, look, they bind to the microtubules and migrate to the perinuclear center. So what's going on? Is this a treatment for exfoliation? So far, nobody has put in for a clinical trial, uh, but that's something that ought to be done. And beyond that, I'm not sure where to start with this, but this is one drug that has obviously uh, transformed the morphology of the cells in exfoliation syndrome in culture. Mitochondria are also depolarized. And remember, mitochondria die before nerve cells. Mitochondria, uh, the axons, the dendrites are packed with mitochondria. The mitochondria go, then the axons go, then the neuronal cells die. And it happens in Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, uh, ALS. And the same thing appears to happen in exfoliation syndrome. Uh, I didn't include the slide on here, but there's a significant uh, across-the-board depolarization of mitochondria in patients with exfoliation syndrome. Okay, so just to wind up on uh, sake of time here, uh, extracellular age-related protein aggregates make exfoliation syndrome, it's an age-related aggregopathy similar to other neurodegenerative diseases. And a cultured 
Tenon's fibroblasts show many of the features of the diseases that I've just mentioned, the other uh, neurodegenerative diseases and also macular degeneration. Dysfunctional mitochondria are not dis degraded by the uh, lysosomes. They're not degraded, and the more dysfunctional and aging mitochondria pile up, the sicker the cell gets, eventually the cell dies. And these dysfunctional mitochondria can't control reactive oxygen species, which cause oxidative damage and accelerate the disease production. And uh, restoring mitochondrial function should serve to slow neuronal death in glaucoma and other neurodegenerative diseases. So we want to improve autophagy. We want to stabilize the microtubules, and we want to activate the autophagic signaling pathways to get them to work to get rid of all the junk. Uh, we want to increase chaperones, which I really haven't mentioned and I'm not going to say a lot about. We want to improve mitochondrial function with mitochondrial stabilizers, targeted antioxidants, and perhaps rapamycin, which I'll mention briefly. Now, if we want to stimulate autophagy, there's a lot of things to do it, okay? They're all over the place, including simple things like aspirin, melatonin, many natural products. And I'm not going to mention most of these. What I'm going to mention is uh, possible treatments for mitochondrial preservation. We, autophagy continuously removes aging mitochondria, okay? We, we've kind of gone through that. Stimulators of autophagy include a number of different compounds, including resveratrol, which I didn't mention, melatonin, uh, and nicotinamide. And interleukin-6, which is supposed to be bad for glaucoma, and it's in negative... Uh, it's, it's detrimental in many papers that have been published on my animal models of glaucoma and cell models of glaucoma protects pancreatic cells from apoptosis by stimulating autophagy. I came across this paper. It's a new paper. It's just published a couple of months ago. I don't know how to interpret it. I just mention it for the sake of completion because IL-6 has been reported now to work in two di different directions. I came up about eight years ago and then refined it over the years with a Com series of compounds uh, narrowed down from 16, which nobody could swallow, to 8, uh, which are very all the most powerful uh, mitochondrial protectants, antioxidants, and uh, anti-inflammatories, which I could put into, you know, three pills which people could take uh, every day and get enough of. And that includes curcumin, which I've mentioned, and acetylcysteine, which is neuroprotective. Ginkgo biloba, I have a whole nother, it's a whole nother lecture, okay? But ginkgo improves peripheral blood flow, it improves Raynaud's, it improves blood flow to the brain and the eye, and it inhibits all the bad things that uh, are involved in apoptosis, like uh, glutamate synthesis and uh, lipid peroxidation of membranes and calcium release from mitochondria. And it also is a very powerful mitochondrial protectant. It stabilizes mitochondrial structure and function that occur with aging, and it stabilizes ATP production, among a couple of other things. And then lipoic acid, citicoline, coenzyme Q10, these are all mitochondrial protectants. Grapeseed and extract and green tea extract uh, are in there because they replace, really they've been reported to be beneficial, and they also replace uh, ingredients which we couldn't put in there because they're too expensive, like pycnogenol, which is made out of mar uh, French maritime pipe mark extract. The newest thing is nicotinamide or NAD+, plus or nicotinamide riboside. Nicotinamide is freely available. These other two are patented. Uh, and a lot more expensive. They are very, very powerful uh, inhibitors of, and, of uh, apoptosis and mitochondrial stimulators. I don't think I put the uh, references in here, but the paper by Lynn et al. 
uh, showed that it's essential for vision in mice and prolongs lifespan. It's kind of like it was resveratrol or caloric restriction, but they showed that it's essential for vision and pro and when we and prolongs lifespan. And I started taking NAD the day after I read the paper. Uh, more has come out, another paper out of Simon John's group with nicotinamide, uh, also known as vitamin B3. Uh, it also was reported to prevent glaucoma in mice, but the amount given to the mice would mean you have to take about a pound a day. So that's up in the air, but it is, again, a very strong mitochondrial inhibitor, and goji berry or wolfberry, which has been worked on for many years by So Kwok Fai in Hong Kong, uh, is also uh, neuroprotective. Uh, just to mention this, rapamycin is an antibiotic and uh, may uh, improve mitochondrial remodeling and reprogram energy metabolism. And another drug like that is simvastatin. These are antibiotics. Can they help in exfoliation? I don't know. But rapamycin enhances autophagy and decreases the number of degenerating neurons in axotomy. I'm going to skip uh, here uh, the um, biochemical composition, which is enormously long list. But just to say the major ones are the fibrillin, loxel one clusterin, which is an extracellular chaperone I mentioned before, and that stabilizes protein folding. I'm not going to get into it because it may be upregulated, downregulated at various uh, stages of the diseases. It's, uh, there's a lot more clustering around when you have mature exfoliation, but maybe that's because there's so much exfoliation, it's making the cell produce a lot more clustering but not getting anywhere. Versicans, essential for elastic fibers. And we found a component, elevated com uh, C1Q, which is a component of the complement activating system, suggesting uh, or adding to the conception of uh, a, a low-grade inflammatory component. So exfoliation, uh, it's an... Disease of the extracellular matrix, it's a conformational disease of misfolded proteins, which may be infectious, which has uh, a lot of oxidative damage, and uh, maybe there's some autoimmune phenomenon in there, nobody's really looked at that, and there's also low-grade inflammation. Uh, clustering, as I mentioned, it stabilizes protein aggregates. Uh, here you see it in exfoliation, and there's tons of the stuff around because there is so because of the exfoliation material. Whereas in POAG, you don't see elevated uh, levels of clustering. Clustering and fibrillin co-localize with exfoliation material in the anterior portion of the lens, and it has many roles in the cells. I mentioned it's a chaperone; it stabilizes proteins. It complexes with, and it helps clear misfolded extracellular matrix proteins like beta amyloid and Alzheimer's plaques. It protects against oxidative stress-induced cell death. And we suggest that there's an abnormality, or there's an, so we suggest that there's an abnormally high level of misfolded proteins, the exfoliation material, which overwhelm the chaperone activity in preventing the aggregation or removal of exfoliation, and so both of them are just increased and piled up within the cell. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I didn't get the conclusions here. Uh, we're going to have to reverse this. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, uh, exfoliation is a protein disorder. It's an ocular manifestation of a systemic disease. The systemic associations and their importance need further study. Non-pressure lowering treatment modalities are potentially of applicable to exfoliation syndrome. And I think that the more we look at these and the more we find and the more possible modalities that are piling up, I think that the lowering of intraocular pressures become 
going to become less and less important because we will be able to uh, find ways to stop exfoliation syndrome before it gets to the level or gets to the stage of elevated intraocular pressure. And the elucidation of the pathophysiology and genetics and application of directed therapy could eventually lead to its elimination. Thank you.